serverless. Uh, I'm Srinath Pera, uh, your presenter today. Uh, today we talk, we'll talk about uh, uh, some of the our, some of the work we have done recently um, uh, about the serverless technology and uh, our assessments around that. Uh, so let's get started. Okay. Uh, so let's start with a few observations, few few trends that we see in uh, our technology landscape. Uh, one of the trends we see is that the complexity of systems we build are increasing. Now, for example, if you look at, uh, we see uh, significant adaption of technologies like Kubernetes and service mesh. Uh, these technologies uh, give us more control and uh, simplify uh, building of complex systems, especially distributed systems. At the same time, they are complex to set up and also need a lot of knowledge to get started. Also, they are distributed systems by nature and have complex failure uh, considerations, etc., which make them uh, complicated. Also, another trend we see is that microservices. Microservices is a way to uh, microservices effectively let us uh, really let us break a system into loosely coupled services. Uh, loose a couple of microservices and so such that each service can release independently. This reduces the complexity of releases, but to enable that, we add much more complexity into the system. Just like with Kubernetes, we, uh, the system is now distributed. There are many services uh, which can fail independently. Uh, which means we need observability to make sure everything works and uh, we need uh, complicated uh, devops uh, so uh, so overall the uh, i believe still the uh, it's net net positive but if you look at a system that we deploy compared to what we deploy years back they are much more complicated Secondly, we know in, in computing, a lot of resources improve exponential. For example, if you look at the computing power, it has uh, improved exponentially. Uh, uh, the same is true for bandwidth, storage, etc. Maybe not at the same speed, but they are, they are improving significantly. However, this is not true for latency. If you look at the networks, the, their bandwidth has improved a lot. We were we are looking at one gig network, 10 gig networks, now even 100 gig networks within span of few years. However, latency have not improved. Uh, actually, if you want much more detail, if you, when you get the slide deck, there's a link, link from the slide deck which is called uh, latest legs bandwidth. So which the, what that means is that the application we build would need to worry about latency for years to come. It's not like computing power where if your latency is not high enough, you just wait a few years and it'll be fine. The latency problems continue to be there. The second case is that most of our web pages and applications do multiple API calls. If you have an application that do four API calls, 60% of the users, sorry, about 40% of the users will see the 90th percentile of your latency because they do four service calls. 
Uh, so basically, uh, so you they run that risk of seeing 90 percent percentile lowers four times, which means there's chance about 40 percent that they'll see. Also, if you look at the uh, wide area network latency, it is significantly higher than a data center latency, which could be as high as 300 times. So what this means is doing calls across wide area network is expensive and will continue to be expensive. Now on the other hand, we see APIs are uh, gaining a lot of ground. They have significant adoption. Already a significant amount of internet traffic come from API. Which means, I think very very soon, a lot of applications would at least use one API. However, what that means is, if your application runs in on-premise, you will face, you will have to do a network calls over the wide area network to get to the API which will significantly affect your latencies. So it's a natural solution is for you to move into the cloud. On this situation, actually cloud is a much better solution because you could place your applications and API providers can also place APIs in the cloud, in which case you get much better latencies than area so we we believe this is a, we believe this latency effects are significant and this um, with the adoption of apis this would also drive more and more applications into the cloud So we see this, this picture shows few trends that are driving application into the cloud. The first is complexity of systems increasing as we just discussed. The second is that latency effects. The third is latency effects, which already discussed. The third is that developers are in short supply. We know that software is eating the world, but the supply of developers are limited. So increasingly we find that we can't find enough developers. Taken together with the complex, the increased complexity of systems, this creates incentives for, for organizations to move their system into the cloud to work at high level of abstractions not having to manage observability devops etc also to simplify and reduce the amount of code that they write and manage now these three things that uh, fact that the developer sign short supply uh, complexity of systems are increasing and the latency effect together with the classical cloud advantages are driving more more and more applications to the cloud so we believe this would accelerate as time comes and a lot of applications a lot of new applications will end up in the cloud So uh, if, you, if you are following these uh, technologies, you may have seen that the serverless started with the introduction of uh, function as a service, Amazon Lambda. What was significant was that before Amazon Lambda or function as a service and other fast offerings, 
if you want to write any code even a simple glue code that connects maybe two parts of your system you would have to drop down to infrastructure as a service now although at that time we already had the platform as a service which means you could write you could you could run things in the cloud with the higher level abstraction than the VA. However, even to write any code, you have to drop down to infrastructure as a service, boot up a VM, and write your code, then manage that VM, etc. Now, Amazon Lambda and the other function as a service for changes. So they change the abstraction level. Now you don't have to worry about anything. You just go and write a function. You write the code. And the function as a service take care of the rest, including the deployment, fault tolerance, scale, etc. So this reduced the amount of detail a programmer need to understand. which actually increase the potential programmer pool. So what happens is if you are a startup and if you are, if you, your main goal is to get the system, get your uh, idea working, this is a very attractive offering. At this point, you don't know how much traffic you get. So you could go and just write some code mainly what you want to do and you are ready you don't have to worry about machines or starting service managing them failures etc also if you think about programming a lot of colleagues the teaching how to write the logic about the for loop if loop that how to write a control flow it can be trained, but a lot of complexity of teaching a program account from understand the environment, understand the machine, understand all the other details. Now serverless removes all this, which means you could someone who has much less knowledge could do still get a lot done in this system. Okay, so let's let's quickly discuss what is serverless. So we we had explored uh, different definitions, and we end up creating a one. We created our own definition because to clarify and to be very clear what serverless, what we think serverless is. Uh, although most of the other definitions also agree, actually you could find the details from a write-up which I will point to at the end, which is a detailed report of our uh, findings, uh, everything we cover in this webinar. So serverless is not just function as a service and lambda. It is everything. It includes platform services. It includes databases, message bus. It's, it's pretty much serverless is the cloud. Because by going to serverless, you would use all these. And it's it's not useful to just think in terms of platform assets. And this is the observation that other definitions also had agreed, although some of them were vague, which is the reason we very clearly re, uh, restated that. So now let's let's dig into serverless. There are a lot of trends and forces that uh, drive imaging technology. So these are some of the uh, forces. These forces include uh, reduction of complexity, 
cost savings, agility, and productivity. Um, success of the cloud, which is actually the main driver, because the the success of an adoption of the cloud create the environment for service to be possible. Also, lose program, lose sorry, lose coupling, and lack of program. Just like with the cloud, privacy and monopoly and vendor locking act as negative forces. So for, uh, for the rest of our talk, uh, we would use a framework for, uh, for critically analyzing image impact bodies which we call ETAC, uh, which is linked from, again, our photograph. It tries to look at the, take a image, tech, emerging technology and look at the impact, feasibility. Im impact means, uh, can it make a real impact? Feasibility is, can it Im implement the scenarios it is promising? then risks and the, how it will evolve into the future. Uh, so then each of these steps are broken into multiple steps. Which, uh, so I will use that framework. However, uh, we don't necessarily have to understand the framework to follow the logic. Uh, so that uh, therefore I'm only linking it at the end. So let's start by uh, looking at the impact of serverless across the industry. So the first observation is that serverless is a natural environment to deploy microservices architecture. If you are doing microservices, you would have broken up your system into in, uh, pretty independent microservices. So it is very likely that you could take them as is so okay so you you still have to change right code you, the your jar file or your var file won't work as is in the serverless however by doing the microservices by thinking about it you would have break up your monolith which is the hardest part of moving to the microservice now where after you had figured out what each microservice each, these microservices can become one or more lambda functions. And your microservice architecture can very easily sit on top of serverless. And it will reduce the complexity you, you have to bear, such as monitoring, managing, uh, deploying those different sets. The second observation is that with serverless, it's much easier to create new APIs. And as we discussed, the latency imposed by wide area networks push applications, give incentive for applications to also move into the cloud. The third observation is that if you are a user who move into the cloud, you would have two choices. Uh, so, uh, of course, uh, the, right now the the most most systems right now are on top of infrastructure as a service, set of VMs, uh, etc. But Almost all major cloud providers support Kubernetes. So Kubernetes in a way has become a way to almost become a portability layer. Because if you build on top of Kubernetes, you can even switch between clouds. So if you go to the cloud, you have a choice of either going for serverless or using Kubernetes. So we'll, we'll come back to this in detail. So, so these are, so what we see is that 
at the macro level across the industry serverless works very well with microservices architecture the upcoming new architecture style and apis and together it will move even more applications into the cloud so so we see at the at the across the industry level serverless has a lot of synergy secondly if you look at from a individual organization point of view which we call micro point point of view serverless can give you high agility because the it reduces the amount of code you have to write it give you fault tolerance auto scaling etc out of the box uh, it also lowers the pl uh, platform cost as it provides a true pay as you go model which basically means you will only pay if it if it is in use so for example if you are a startup until you get traction you only pay little it will also reduce the deployment cost because uh, it will take care of observability devops etc many aspects also it give you very clear cost insights and control over the cost and uh, reduce fixed cost so these advantages are very significant they they give organizations lot of flexibility lot of agility which we know and also the cost savings each of which can be a significant competitive advantage which give them incentives for move to serverless now let's let's switch to now let's switch to uh, the feasibility let's see can serverless do what they promise so as a, at the architecture level serverless has a lot of positives which can give you high available and scaling right away out of the box it can make system programming easier which is to reduce the bar required by programmers it may it let you uh, uh, do polyglot architecture which means your system can use multiple program languages multiple system multiple technologies the disadvantage or negatives or challenges the serverless face are cold starts cold start means the serverless the serverless function would generally get loaded when the first request comes so the first request would have a high latency of course you could avoid this by deciding to keep uh, uh, one uh, uh, function one instance of the function alive but this reduces your cost savings also the serverless each function in each function can only run for limited time which is usually limited to few minutes around five minutes or less so which means a lot of your processing would have to be broken across multiple functions which may use lead to higher tail latency. also serverless use a very event driven model which is a very powerful model if you are familiar with it however if you are not familiar with it it's a little bit hard to reason about and it's a little bit hard to debug also because serverless functions are stateless you need to carefully handle state if you remember anything across 
multiple functions. So, so uh, now if you look at these disadvantages, one observation we can make is that the call starts and tail latency both are present on premise if you go for Kubernetes. The same things come into play. So, so there, are, there are some applications which are very latency sensitive where this may be a significant problem. However, there are enough what we felt when we, when we look at different applications, the details are discussed in the paper. What we felt was that there are enough applications which are not affected by these negatives. So overall we think the serverless is feasible. So these negatives might limit some adoption, but there are, we believe there are still significant use cases. We'll come back to this again. So one challenge serverless face is the, because it's based on EDA, because you have to write functions separately and get them work together, it changes the, ex the develop experience. The ideally you need a tool which you can write separate serverless functions, just like you write functions in uh, some other programming language, then test them and in a push of a button when it's working, it can deploy it into the serverless platform. Also, if something does not work, you can debug, etc. Now, this experience is not fully ready yet. Right now, you have to write serverless function each one separately. And some of the connecting logic would end up in your scripts. To debug, you have to deploy everything into the cloud and test it, etc. So we felt that this lack of tooling and this uh, uh, tooling around this experience is a challenge. But it's very likely that this will be addressed by the IDs. Also, if you look at the skills required for serverless, we do not see any significant challenges there because most of the enterprise programmers, you can very easily retrain in serverless. Actually, they just need to learn less. So they, they're all, most of them are ready. You have to just learn the interfaces. Also, the serverless would enable a larger pool of programmers. Uh, the, I think the required bar become less because a lot of details are handled uh, hidden under the abstractions. So two negatives, if you try to move to serverless, is that one is that first is that serverless is an opinionated solution. Serverless speaks, serverless make a lot of choices. If you're happy with them, things are great. However, if you don't like it, or if you want to tune a specific OS parameter, or maybe some kind of a thread pool, you can't, or it is limited. So, so this is a disadvantage. So this forces you to adopt to this specific model. So this become a disadvantage. The second is that to move to serverless, you need to rewrite most of the systems. 
the need for rewrite come from one first is that its APIs are different. For example, you cannot take your WAR file and put it into the cloud and make it work. It doesn't uh, you the APIs are different. So you need to you need to rewrite these APIs. Also, the serverless has limits such as uh, the each function can only run for a limited time. So you may need to redesign the system around these limitations. What this means is that uh, the, for new applications, people would move for serverless faster, but for existing applications, it would take time. We know like program languages like COBOL are still around after so many years because it's very expensive to change existing system. So I think we'll see the same with the serverless as well. So overall, we think serverless is feasible. There are technical challenges, however, they are not showstoppers. There are still significant use cases that are not affected by those. The developers, there are developers which can we can easily train into serverless. Sorry. Uh, also, we there are some friction. However, again, they are not showstoppers. We believe there are significant use cases which, which would go okay with these limitations. Now, next let's look at the risks associated with serverless. The, the, there are two main risks. They are same as the cloud, which is the lack of standards. Therefore, risk of vendor lock-in and privacy. Now, what we saw was that in case of the cloud, these were concerns. People talk a lot, of, lot about them. But many moved to the cloud nevertheless, which suggests that the advanced cloud advantages seem to count heavier than these two risks. So let's look at the standards a little bit more detail. So if, if a user is worried about portability, you worried about locked in into a single cloud vendor, they could choose to build on top of Kubernetes. Now the way the, the lock-in happens, one part of it is APIs, but it's not that hard to wrap the serverless APIs. That is possible. However, the real challenge comes from platform services. So within your serverless functions or within your services that runs in Kubernetes environment, if you choose to use Amazon S3 or some database service, or a some message broker or any of these many services provided by the cloud vendor, that would be would cause a locking. That would stop you from moving between the clouds. Now, on the other hand, if you choose to use the platform services, it would reduce your complexity. It would reduce the infrastructure that you would want to manage. So you have a trade-off between agility and locking. So it is likely that the new startups would first choose the agility. And when the with time they might choose to switch as they get the more uh, traction. 
So in, in summary, for in terms of risk, we do not see the risk significantly different from cloud. And most likely the same trend of people adopting the cloud regardless of these uh, risks, we think the same will continue with the serverless. So let's look at few of our thoughts regarding the future. So far we discussed, we looked at the impact of serverless. We found that they are significant. We look at the feasibility. We found that it is feasible. Yes, there are, there are certain limitations, but we believe there are significant use cases which are not affected by those limitations. So, so I think overall it is feasible. So we looked at the risk. The risks are as same as the cloud. And they didn't deter cloud. And we do not think they would deter serverless significantly. So on this setting, let's try to look at what might be possible. So the first, first observation is that we would see, we, we believe, within next three years, most of new applications will use serverless. And as they mature, some of them, because they need more flexibility or more tuning, or because they worry about portability, they might migrate to, to run on top of Kubernetes. But lot would stay as is. So as we said already, although there are disadvantages, we do not think they would, they are showstoppers. They might limit some adoption, but there are still significant use cases that are feasible and would be done. As we discussed before, the shortage of developers will further increase the serverless adoption as it, it reduces the amount of developers you need as you deal in high levels of abstraction. Also, it reduces the skill level required by developers, both of whom are solutions to lack of development. The second observation is that as we discussed, the vendor lock-in and standardization, lack of standards, are not a showstopper, just like with the cloud. However, now if you, if you look at right now, the cloud providers do not support standardization. Basically, they are resistant. They use different APIs. And sometimes you feel they intentionally test them. Now, in a, it may be an unlikely case, but if cloud providers choose to adopt standards, common standards, and a low portability of applications across cloud. That might actually be a good thing for them. It's obviously good thing for, good thing for others because it would reduce the complexity of maintaining these systems and risk associated with it. Also, it might be a good thing for cloud providers also because potentially it might significantly increase the adoption of the cloud basically create a win-win situation because they, uh, of course, uh, they, they lose uh, their lock-in, but they, there's a larger potential market that like everybody wants. But of course, we don't know what would happen. Also, there's another scenario, which is that standardization could be enforced, for example, by government or significant buyers or consortiums. And we had seen this happening. And we believe if there is any form of standardization due to any cause, we believe that will significantly far hasten the adoption of serverless. 
of course we don't know how it will work through but i think uh, there are interested the interesting development for us to watch the third thing is that as we discussed we think these the current developments are leading to a phase of or a competition between kubernetes and serverless because if you are a new app that comes to the cloud you could choose to go to serverless or kubernetes if you go to the kubernetes you could got get portability if you choose not to use any of the platform services or you can choose portability and directly go for serverless we felt that the most new systems would start with serverless and only will switch to kubernetes as they get become more complex so the potential reason for uh, for some of these systems to move into kubernetes could be that because their systems are complex they need more better configurations etc they want portability or in some scenarios serverless could be more expensive then they have a lot of friction so another possibility is that kubernetes may choose to eventually match serverless apis for example we see k native happening and so the one could potentially see a serverless like very similar or matching interface on top of serverless sorry kubernetes as well so if that happens you could run in serverless and switch to kubernetes if you have need more control so again we we don't know exactly which version would happen i think based on this trade off and this competition it will decide the uh, the amount of serverless adoption whether it would be a smaller portion or a, or a significant portion i think we there's interesting development for us to see finally serverless if you look at serverless most of these server parts of serverless are replacing middleware because now you don't need the application server you don't need the database it's there you need the, don't need the message broker so on and so forth so this could even this could be end of middleware but at least if you look at the history middleware has continued to specialize and move up the stack so middleware would have to again become specialized which means which could be going to niches or going to specific domains etc so we could potentially think of uh, middleware that run on top of serverless for example if you have a registry it is a collection of services so you could potentially take them and put on top of serverless the same may be true for um as the stream processor etc so so just like you build on top of application server you could build middleware on top of serverless and uh, let the end users write some few other serverless functions to customize it so this is a possible uh, development uh, we felt this is very possible especially within the domains uh, for example the middleware may focus on the domain now the cloud vendors may the compete with compete with this middleware that can try to run top of serverless or they can embrace them help them 
So I, I think if you look at the history, there are two cases. We know that when the Microsoft become widely adopted, they try to control the applications on top of Windows. But uh, it was it, they failed. Like they eventually opened up. Also, I think the antitrust uh, pressure also forced them to open up. On the other hand, Apple, when they build the iPhone, they very early opened up their developer, the App Store, to developers without trying to compete on building applications for the iPhone. And that make that ecosystem very rich and make uh, the applications available. And later when they were competing against the Windows Mobile, this was a significant more. So the same thing could happen in this case of server, uh, middleware that are on top of serverless. Because uh, if, the, uh, if some cloud vendors choose to embrace this middleware that runs on top of the serverless, uh, they might have advantage because they would have a much richer and complete uh, ecosystem for a new, to build a new application. The finally one other observation is that uh, integration middleware are different because although new applications would move to the cloud, there will be significant applications that left in on premise and the usual integration bind these two types of applications. So we, we think even with the serverless, the integration middleware would still have some role to play. So we come into the end of our uh, webinar. So uh, we make few interesting, we discuss few interesting things. We see that most of new apps are moving to the cloud. And after analyzing and looking at serverless critically, we we thought we believe that the most new applications will use serverless within next three years. And when they do, they have a choice between serverless and Kubernetes, which is a trade-off between portability and agility. And I think these developments would decide the extent of serverless adoption. And if you, if I think if you are a startup or a company that uh, organization that try to build a system from the clean slate, I think serverless is a significant contender that you should consider. But if you have already a complex system running, it's it's much trickier choice because you may have to rewrite a lot of things. Um, on which case you may choose to go on top of Kubernetes because uh, that may be cheaper, etc. Uh, but I, we believe that even with this new application, serverless can get a significant market push. Finally, uh, you could, the paper linked from the um, the slides. It discuss what we look, what we discuss in the webinar in a lot more detail, with concrete evidence uh, and uh, with concrete evidence and other papers linked to other papers. Uh, please check it out. Also, if we, if this is uh, so, this is part of uh, our uh, uh, work by WSO to looking at uh, emerging technologies. We have so far looked at serverless and blockchain. Uh, so if you if this is a topic that you are interested, uh, please subscribe to this newsletter. We would notify you when the new reports are available. Uh, so thanks very much. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, please ask them in the control panel.
So I would uh, I would do answer one question while waiting for other questions. The one question is how does the security is handling the serverless case? So the just like with just like running any system, you could isolate the serverless environment using the service uh, security groups. So these are variation of IP tables, etc., which basically stop any other um, uh, cloud applications from getting to your services without going through your proper channel. And the path through the proper channel, you need to secure using standard security mechanisms, like just like in other servers. So there's one more question. Let me. So so the question is, uh, are we doing anything to move WSO to to serverless? Uh, so. Uh, so so not, uh, there's nothing to release right now right so i think the so we are watching and also uh, thinking about how would uh, the serverless would affect middleware right so um uh, so we we are thinking how 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 would the middleware and these platforms could uh, move into serve, move into the cloud? So we uh, so we there's like a lot of we already support the cloud and Kubernetes significantly. Uh, so we are looking in how we can add we can work with the serverless etc. But um, but there's no nothing to announce yet. And second question is, could you make example for successful projects built by the serverless? Yes, actually, uh, the reports list uh, list of uh, list of successful uh, serverless applications. Uh, the serverless application people has uh, deployed. Uh, there's a list and the reports link to that. Uh, also, there was a hacker news thread uh, recently, which asked for any successful serverless applications, and there was few answers there. Uh, next question. So uh, next question is, if you are a large organization, what steps would you take to adopt serverless? So uh, I think the the best is that figure out some of the projects that uh, that is clean slate. Because if you have a part of the system running somewhere else, uh, not in the cloud, it's it's tricky. It's possible, for example, you can do Amazon VPC, some things like that, but it's complicated. And uh, so uh, I think you would go, you, you shouldn't go that far initially. The best is figuring out uh, clean slate projects and start with that, right? And uh, um, basically build on top of that. So there are some cases where people found that after they were get significant traction, serverless turned out to be very expensive. In there are a few, at least I saw a few cases that they moved away after that. But I think at the initial stage, um, it's it's uh, cost effective. So the next question. Uh, if you have stateful system. Uh, so, so I mean, if you look at the enterprise architecture, what we see is that it is very rare that we would uh, work with soft state. So, so, 
So, okay, so let me, so if you look at the enterprise and distributed system architectures, there are three kinds of state. One is the session state, right? So the, uh, the, so the session states, it is, I mean, right now the serverless and do not support it directly. Uh, right now, if you want to handle it, you have to put that into a database. Uh, which is also a common solution, which is okay. But I think if it is a significant concern, it's something that they can implement. I believe it is reasonably easy to implement. So that's the first kind of state. The second kind of state is that state that is stored in the database, persistent state. Now, when you come to this, there's no real difference between serverless versus uh, using Kubernetes or some other on-premise system because same thing you you, that's, you have a database you write to it. The third state is this runtime state. For example, you may have a counter or something. The well-designed systems rarely use this third kind of state because you you lose it when you fail. Uh, so so I think. I believe it's not a, this third kind of state is not a significant concern. Um, the, I think right now in the serverless function, for example, if you have a database connection pool, it'll get reset every time. Uh, that's not good. Or, or uh, your JIT compilations, would you lose them. That's not good. So there are things like that, but I think these, can be solved. I mean, they they are problems right now, but if you think in first principle, they can be solved. So, so I I I do not at least personally I don't see a significant difference between Kubernetes and serverless for in terms of state. And next question: Which tools are currently available to create serverless structure? The most people write each function separately and then um, basically write scripts to deploy them, which is, a, as I discussed, which is a significant friction you would face if you use serverless because the experience, because you have write each function separately and deploy them separately and test them in the cloud, etc. It is not as friendly as I like, set of function. So, but again, if I think fundamentally it's an easy problem to fix. I think the IDs would fix it. And next question. And for a, next question is for a serverless version, is your intention to layer the WSO2 management deployment interface over serverless with WSO2 handling creation of the serverless element? Um, so this is this is that's possible. So um, we I mean I we have we we don't so I can't like. Um, so I, I can't give an exact solution what we would do. But for example, uh, some of the, I mean, one potential way of thinking about the future of middleware is that, for example, you go to your ID, you design something, and the output is set of serverless functions, which you can deploy to serverless and run. So the, these serverless functions may come with some other serverless functions which give you help, give you help, right? For example, let's say you, if you want to open banking solution, uh, the, you might get set of serverless functions. I'm not promising that. I'm saying we are exploring this. I don't think uh, everybody like it's uh, the this how the middleware and serverless would develop is very clear yet. We are looking very seriously into that. Um, 
and uh, we will we'll announce when we when we have decided uh, so that's the question so far uh, thanks very much for uh, joining if you have any other questions feel free to drop a mail to me directly or uh, or through our contact us forms i'm happy to get back to you uh, thanks very much for joining hope this was useful thanks very much